Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Everybody doing all right today? Yes, sir. Whew, man, been going through them storms. I kept getting woke up last night, that rain and the wind, and I got huge trees in the yard, and I was like, oh, Lord, <laughs> help. Oh, wanted to wish everybody happy Father's Day. And people saying, you're going to preach a Father's Day message? Yes, your father loves you. He's in heaven. Jesus is at the right hand interceding for you. He's looking out for you. And he's wanting you as a father to lead your families well. And the best way to do that is to give them God's word. So that's what we're going to do today. That's the Father's Day message. Be a godly father. Can I be real with y'all? You know, a lot of times people get in pulpits and you never know who they are or what's going on. And everybody looks so squared away and all tight and right and got it all put together. I had a dream this morning and everybody goes, woo. I had a dream this morning that I was sitting in the audience at church, kind of like we just were, music's playing and they all finish up and everybody's just sitting there. And it's like, Aren't you going to go preach? Me? Why me? Why not you? Then I thought, what am I going to say? I don't know what to say. Oh God, I've got nothing to say. And the good Lord kind of let me know, that's right. It's only what I have to say that matters. Because I was thinking, do I need to prepare this message, that message, this message? And God says, no, all you do is prepare you. I give the message. I am the message. I'll let you know what to say and when to say it. He has me write notes down. What y'all don't understand is we're starting lesson nine, part nine of the gospel of the kingdom of God. Nine weeks, he gave all this, he dropped this in me in about 20 minutes, and I can't get it out, I'm on my ninth week. And it was like, well, Lord, what do I share? He said, my word. Okay, can you be a little more specific? He said, yeah, my word. Not, not your word, mine. The very title, he keeps throwing things back to the very title, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Not the gospel of men. Not the gospel of the Baptist, the Methodist. The, the gospel of God. His will. His way. His thoughts. His opinions. His word on the matter. And I was just sitting there and it's like, the Lord just keeps flooring me. And just the, those, you know, the coming up in the 60s. Oh, that's a heavy revy, man, right? Yeah. And I was looking in uh, Mark. He just kind of led me to, to Mark. I was thinking about the fact that here Jesus spent all the time with all these disciples, telling them everything, letting them know, I'm, I'm telling you this stuff so when it happens, you won't be wigged out. You won't be wondering, oh, no, what's happening? He's already told them so. So here in, in uh, Mark chapter 16, this is after the resurrection. You know, Jesus already died went to the tomb and then he comes out of the tomb and he's being seen by others and talking to others and they go back and let other people know about it and they're like uh-uh uh-uh and in verse 14 after they've been told after the disciples been told and they're like uh-uh i ain't believing that that's what i was told this past weekend I was talking to some kids this past weekend, little girl about five, six years old, I was talking to her about Jesus. She just kept looking at me. Is that real? That ain't real. Is that real? Yeah, baby, it's real. And then a brother that was a little older, he's about 12. Oh, me personally, 
I don't believe any of that God stuff. At 12, the Father's Day message, you fathers need to be telling your children about the Heavenly Father and don't let these poor little children be lost and heading for hell. Amen. My gracious. And I was sitting there and he led me to this and it, and it says in verse 14, after they all been talking about Jesus coming back and everybody's like, no, I, I don't believe that. And he says in verse 14, this is King James Version, this is free, it's not in your notes if you're looking it up. It said, afterward he appeared unto the leaven, that's Jesus, as they sat at meat, and that's what we were doing. I was at a dinner talking to kids and hearing all this garbage. And it says, and he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which had seen after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Whoa. That's a hard word. I don't know why it is. A lot of times I don't want to preach. I always feel like the Lord puts things on my heart and I just, I've always been a, a warrior. Just honestly, I, I, those of you that don't know out here in TV land, spent 32 years as a police officer. I used to do a lot of fighting as a kid. I've always been raised to just, if something ain't right, we're going to tear it down. We're going to make this thing right. You're going to be a bully, you better, psh. And that was just the heart that God put in me to injustice, you know, a righteous anger against sin, against. And I feel the heart of God when people, he spent all this time with them and they wouldn't believe him. And he comes back and says, listen, you preach the word. If they believe, great. If they don't, they're damned. It's on them. Well, that ain't love. I can't make anybody do anything. And Jesus loves you enough to let you choose him or deny him. Please choose him. But he was pointing out how he was getting on to them because they did not believe. They refused to believe. Even though he told them everything was going to happen. And now they're like, uh-uh. And that's the same thing going on right this minute. As I'm standing in this pulpit and I'm preaching here to the people in this room and the people out here on this camera... I will say stuff straight from God's word and people are going to say, uh-uh. You're not denying me. You're not discounting me. You better get in the book and understand. And over in Matthew 28, the same thing at the end of Matthew 28 it says, and Jesus came and spake to them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Jesus is flat out letting us know, listen here, guys. I'm it. I am all in all, and I'm giving me to you. Take it or leave it. And if you take it, if you accept the gift, he says right there in verse 19, Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Why am I preaching? Because God said to right here. We are commanded, instructed, ordered. Jesus never gave a suggestion. You know, hey guys, what, what do you think about? Do you think you ought to tell anybody about me? Go into all nations teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. God's word is you do what I say. Not what you think, 
not what you feel, not what fits your little doctrine. The gospel of the kingdom of God. He's the king. It's his kingdom, his rule, his reign. What he says goes. And when we walk in obedience to his word, it works. You can choose to walk in the blessings of God. You can choose to inherit in e eternal life with him. Or you can choose to be damned. It's on each one of us individually. We get to make the choice. And that's why we come here week after week after week to instruct in righteousness, to let you know so you can't ever say, well, I didn't know. <laughs> he gave us all the book so we could know. So I'm going to dive in and try part nine and hopefully wrap this portion up. And we'll do new titles or else I could keep going because the whole book cover to cover is the gospel of the kingdom of God. These are not words of men. All right. I'm going to just kind of quick review. You know, in part eight of this series, we're covering uh, multiple verses about how serious uh, Jesus was about cutting the sin out of our lives. He used piper, uh, yeah, I can't even talk right. He used the hyperboles, used parables, you know, told stories, and we remember at, at the last one we looked at was in Matthew twenty-five. I mean Matthew five twenty-nine and thirty, Matthew five twenty-nine and thirty, where he was talking about if your hand offended you to cut it off, or if your eye was offending you, if it was something going on because of this, or because of this, that was going to keep me out of heaven? He said, get rid of it. That's how serious Christ is about living in, walking in, staying in, remaining in a sin-filled, all-about-you life. And it don't matter if you say, but I'm a Christian. Not according to God, you aren't. Understand. He would never have talked so serious about it. He was pointing out to us all the time how serious he was about how we also should be confronting sin. Not walking in it. We're not supposed to accept it. Not supposed to excuse it. Not supposed to stay in it. In this earth, since the fall of man... Sin is something that plagues us. Let's get real. It's here. I'm not denying it. Anybody that does is clueless. <laughs> but because it's here, Jesus gave us a way to be victors over it. Walking in the sacrifice of the spotless Lamb of God is the way to win. When we walk according to God's will, His will is to set us free, to deliver us, to cleanse us, to make us new creatures in Christ, to be filled with His Spirit, to be overcomers, not to be overcome. Victory occurs in our lives when we walk in loving obedience to our Heavenly Father. That's the Father's Day message. That's reality, folks. The grace of God will bring us through. You remember the prayer, right? Not my will, but thine be done. That's the whole message. This is the gospel of the kingdom. Walking in the resurrection power of the Holy Ghost. Don't try to walk this life alone under your own power. Don't think you can come out here and just be a good kid and, and, and you got it. Christ himself said that, you know, your, your righteousness is as filthy rags. You will never be good enough. There's only one good and his name is God. And until he's in you, nothing in you is going to be any good. So we walk in the goodness of God. We do good through God, not to earn God, but because God saved us from the sin. So now I can walk in him and do what is right and good and clean and pure in his eyes as a pleasing, obedient child. Understand the heart of God. Mm. Remember, we left off in the last lesson... Uh, we were going over to, uh, Hebrews 12, 1, and we were going down, and I was breaking down the verse, and we talked about, there in the King James Version, it talked about the sin that so easily besets you. A lot of people read King James and don't understand, and that's why I always tell people, get a different version, 
break it down, make sure you understand, is just point out that every one of us has a battle with sin. Every last one of us has something that is your little Achilles heel or the thorn in the flesh for Paul. Some of you, like I said, I think I mentioned last week, it might, might have been gambling or, you know, it might be sexual things. It, it might be lying. It might be gluttony. When's the last time you heard a fat preacher talk about gluttony? You know? We can jump on the bandwagon about homosexuality. What about gossip? We all battle something. And the thing is, it's within us. Personally, if we... Uh, think about this. If we looked at uh, James 1.14... So I don't know if we got to that last time, so I'm going to cover that one. James 1.14 says that every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Our own lust, our own desires. Satan knows which button to push in you. And he will keep pushing it. Some people think, well, I've already conquered this. It's a daily conquering. Why do you think the good Lord said to take up your cross daily? We have to stay consistent, to stay continually walking in the Spirit and do what the Lord says. The only way to stay clean is to keep putting the clean in and washing the dirty out. Honestly can't get no simpler you got a bucket of dirty water pour the dirty water out put clean water in that's called the washing of the word the renewing of the mind through the washing of the word so that's what we're doing that's what we're going to do right now that's what we do each week when we get here we try to wash away all the garbage that this world has been putting on us all right so i'm going to start out in psalms 119 Verses 9 through 11. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11. We've been talking about sin. And the question is, then how in the world do I get cleaned up? What do I do? You run to the good Lord. And you surrender to him. And you do what he asks you to do. And right here, that's what David is doing right here in Psalms 119, starting in verse 9. And I'm going to read this uh, starting off in the ERV version. It says, how can a young man live a pure life? And that's an honest question. People that are battling sin is like, why do I keep doing this? I'm messing up. I'm struggling. How do I get clean? How do I get right? That's an honest question. Do you know God likes honest questions? Because he is truth. And he likes to give you true, honest answers. And he says that them that seek will find. As long as you're ignoring and doing your own thing. And then he answers it in the next part of that verse. It says, by obeying your word. How do you live a pure life? By walking in obedience to the word of God. Huh. Look at verse 10. I try with all my heart to serve you. Now notice the first part of that verse started with an I. I want to point out two things. One, there has to be a personal surrender, a personal commitment. You yourself have to choose God. But as we choose God, then we get the understanding that without God, we can't make it. I have to surrender my will to His. That's called conversion. That's called changing masters. That's called letting him be the king of my life. And once I surrender, then I look at that last half that says, help me obey. Oh, oh, wait a minute, what did I do? I just invited God to have his way. I'm here. I want. I'm trying. I'm desiring. But it takes you, God. As we take that first step, you walk out in faith. You know, think about when God's talking to Abraham. I want you to go to a land I'm going to show you. Go where? I'll show you. 
God's waiting on us. He's already done the first part. You think you're waiting on him? No, no, no. He's waiting on you. And as we step out in faith according to his word, and that's what's going on here, I surrender, I'm trying, I want to do what you want me to do. Help me. And we invite God in. We make that choice to change. And he'll honor that. And he'll help you through. And verse 11 says, I study your teaching very carefully so that I will not sin against you. That's your part. To get into his word to find out what he says on the matter. People, would you believe that people leave a Bible closed and they actually go to buildings they call churches and expect some guy to tell them everything they're supposed to know? You ever think about that? God says, I want to tell you what I want you to know. I am my word. Get in the book individually, personally. Have a first-person relationship with me. Come and taste of me and see that I am good. Don't let somebody else always tell you something. Find it for yourself. I like uh, in the King James Version, verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. I'm putting Jesus in. I'm accepting him. I'm seeking him. I'm looking for him. I am now feeding on him, the bread of life, the blood, the bread, the flesh, taking Christ in. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. As you're feasting at God's table, taking in the manna from heaven, the true bread of life here, the things of the world will lose their appeal. Now, it doesn't mean they won't keep coming. It doesn't mean Satan's going to give up on you. Oh no, remember back in the, uh, out there in the wilderness, he kept jumping all over Jesus. You think he's going to jump on Jesus and ignore you? If he's dumb enough to go after Jesus, he's definitely coming after you. Why? Because you dare to name, name the name? Now you are a little Christ? He thought it was bad when he had one Jesus. And now when they got Christ-like ones everywhere, he's definitely stepped up the battle. He's coming after you. But you put the word in. And you understand, as I'm walking with him, walking for him, walking like him, I win. I walk in obedience. But what if I fall? Get up! <clears throat> Repent! Means to change. If you just blew it, change what you did. Get up. Get back on. Stay in the battle. Don't you dare get out on the field, get shot and lay down and whine. You're not dead yet. Keep on. Keep fighting. It ain't over. Them that endure till the end shall be saved. Don't let Satan strip you of what Christ has given to you, made available for you, and has promised you to come. Don't give in. Don't give up. Get up. Get back. Keep going on. Look in 1 John 5, 3 through 5. 1 John 5, 3 through 5. I'm going to read this one in the ERV. It says, Loving God means obeying His commands. Hmm. Think about that. So if you're not obeying Him, He's saying, you don't love me. And God's commands are not too hard for us. Oh, God just wants too much. Really? Really? Instead of killing somebody... He'd rather you let them live. Boy, that's just too much. Instead of saying something mean, ugly, and nasty to somebody, he'd rather you said something nice or just kept your mouth shut. Oh, that's just too hard. I can't do that. 
People get so silly. Remember, God created you. He knows you more, better than you know yourself. He understands what works and what doesn't. He knows what we have need of. And we act like he's clueless. And we've got it all figured out. Someone in that little relationship is clueless, all right. Better figure who it is. Look at verse 4. It says, because everyone... I remember he said that the commands of, of God aren't too hard. It says, because everyone who is a child of God has the power to win against the world. Think about that. The Holy Spirit of God in you, and you're going to tell me you can't win? I'm going to tell you, if you walk with Christ, there's no way you couldn't win. With Him, who, who's going to stand against you and actually succeed? They're not. It is our faith that has won the victory against the world. When we say, yes, Lord, we believe him, we walk in faith according to his ways, we obey his commands, things work. When you don't, it don't. Why are you defeated? Pay attention to what we're covering. Showing you verse. Look at verse 5. Remember, this is 1 John 5, and this is verse 5 in the ERV. It says, so who wins against the world? He answers, only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And when he's talking believe, he means committed. He means believe in, not just about. Not just saying, yeah, I know there was some historical figure. Y'all understand? The devil believes there's a God. You, you get that, right? He was in heaven, done been kicked out. It's not about believing about something. It's about believing in, committing to, giving your life, and walking in obedience. It's converting, being born again. Look at Psalm 37. Psalm 37, uh, 39 and 40. I'm going to read this out of the Living Bible. It says, The Lord saves the godly. That sounds weird, don't it? <laughs> it says, He is their salvation and their refuge when trouble comes. So if trouble's coming and you start doing the things God's wanting because you're trying to be godly, which is godlike, and now that means being obe obedient to God, it says He saves you. God's saving the godly. Hmm. <laughs> Verse 40. Because they trust in him, he helps them and delivers them from the plots of evil men. Because they trust in him. Think about that. He helps and delivers. Some people look like they're squared away. Well, they're probably walking in obedience. Why is your life in such turmoil? Well, you might not be giving your situations to the Lord. You might be trying to handle things on your own and doing things your way, possibly. I'm just asking. Because here God says, He's got it if you let Him. If you walk in obedience to Him, if you're walking godly, you're walking in obedience, He is your salvation. He is your deliverer. He is your help in time of need. I'm going to read that again in the King James Version. It says, But the salvation of the righteous, who's He saving? Those that are in right standing with Him. That's what righteousness is. The salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. When trouble comes, folks, if you walk 
with God. You walk to God. You walk in God. You win. You walk from God. Row, row. And verse 40 says, And the Lord shall help them, who's them? The righteous, and deliver them from the wicked, and save them because they trust in him. Who is God taking care of? His own. Those who give their life to him, those who become his children, he watches over them. Hmm. Better get in the book. Look at First Chronicles. We're going to jump way back into the old. Because, you know, that was just for them, right? All scripture, folks. First Chronicles 28. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. I'm going to read this in the King James Version. It says, Know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. You can't pull nothing over God. God knows what you're thinking. God knows what's going on in your heart of hearts. And you think about that. Think like with David, you know, here in, in Psalms. You know, scripture talks about he was a man after God's own heart. Well, funny, I kind of seem to remember that boy was messing up a lot. He messed up, just like you and I. But he fessed up got back up, cried out to God, kept seeking. See, and you've got to understand, he didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have today. And still, knowing what God preferred, knowing God wanted better than what he was walking in, he cried out to the Lord, God, I've blown it. I've sinned against you. Not that dude. <laughs> You I've sinned against. And God said he's a man after. He was seeking after him. That's where we need to be. That's where you need to stay. Seeking him. Have that heart that's longing to be like him, with him, pleasing to him. Not to earn salvation. It ain't about works to get saved. It's about loving him because he saved me. And I want to please him. I want to spend time with him. I want to be one with him. I want to have a good, close relationship. I don't want to know a, about some stranger. I want to know you. And that's what God's looking for. It says right here in the last part of that verse 9, If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But notice how that started. It started with that huge two-letter word, if. Who does God reveal himself to? Only those that seek. If all you do is spend all week for you and the devil, and you maybe dare to go to a box on a corner on a weekend and listen to some guy talk for a while while you take a nap, but look at the last half. Wake up a minute for this one. You better look. First Chronicles 28, verse 9. Look at that last portion. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. Doesn't that go back to what we read in Matthew? If they don't believe, they're damned. You better understand the God of the Bible, folks. You judge it. No, no, no. God is. God's got standards. God's got a plan. You line up with his plan, it's great. You don't. It ain't so great. Scripture talks about that great and terrible day of the Lord. For some, it will be great. For some, it's going to be terrible. Better understand, 
Look at Jeremiah, since we're back here in the back. Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, uh, verse 10. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins. Now think about this. I always get people to ask me those questions. Well, what about that guy over in that country that don't speak this language and possibly never? Your Heavenly Father that created you. He knows what's going on. And He searches the hearts and minds of men. And He lets you know and there is nobody in this world that can say, I don't know that there's something bigger than me out here. People try to say, well, I'm an atheist. No, you're just being silly. You know, whether you want to admit it or not is one thing. But you know in your heart of hearts, there is a God. You better get a clue. It says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Does it matter what you do? Yes. God knows what you do, but even further than that, he knows why you're doing it. Are you doing things to please men? Are you doing things out of love with a grateful heart to a heavenly father? Understand about rewards and blessings, what bring them about, and understand what Christ calls filthy rags. It ain't about works. It's about doing what the father asks. Get the message. And I was thinking about that again. And yes, there's another commercial. It's not in your notes. Thinking about the things we do. All the time, God's just plopping things in. And I'm like, Lord, I can't. The message is already this long. Like Matthew 11:20, 20. Talking about things he did. Matthew 11:20 20 in the ER version. It says here, it says, Then Jesus criticized the cities where he did most of his miracles. He criticized these cities because the people there did not change their lives and stop sinning. What? Jesus got on to people for doing wrong? Oh, that ain't loving. That's judging. People, you better quit listening to the devil. Jesus loves you so much that he told you the bridge was out. That he told you there's a hell that awaits for those that disobey his word. He loved you so much, he's telling you. And he's doing it again right this second out of the mouth of this vessel. It ain't about me. It's about him, his message for you right now. Matthew 12, 30 says, whoever is not with me is against me. And anyone who does not work with me is working against me. There's not a middle ground. Verse 33 in there is talking about where a tree is known by its fruit. And you better understand who it is that's saying this. This is Jesus Christ, the uno, one, only, anointed one. The one who said he's the door, he's the way. He knows what he's talking about. Matthew 12, 41. All this was going in a progression. He was getting on to them. Because they say, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian. I'm living like the devil, but I'm a Christian. Oh, really? 
Matthew 12, 41, he says, The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. They were like we are now in this world, all the garbage going on. And God told Jonah, go let them know. And Jonah, kind of like me, starting off this message saying, I really didn't want to be here and I don't want to talk about stuff like this and I don't want to be the heavy. Jonah kind of said the same thing. God, please don't make me go. So he tries to run away and next thing we know, we get a story about a big fish and the first guy to get regurgitated on a beach and starts preaching like a madman. The people repented. Right now, as you're hearing me preach this word, you have the same choice. He says, they repented at that preaching, and behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus is talking to them. So you don't have a clue who I am. Those folks actually listen to him. Here I am, the Savior, telling you, and y'all are rejecting. Well, I'm a this and I'm a that. And, you know, my church, we don't talk like that. And we're living in an unrepentant day, folks. People do what they want to do. It don't even matter if they're the president. They just do what they want to do. Understand. God is not mocked. We will all have that day. And we're all going to be held accountable to what we did with God's word. Matthew 12, 50. Talking about family, talking about Father's Day. <laughs> Who is the family of God? Matthew 12, 50 says, For whosoever shall do. Look this up, folks. Whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. You a Christian? Then you better be doing God's word. Doing. What does that mean? It means get in the book, find out what he says, and do it. We are accountable to God personally, folks. Choose you this day who you're going to serve. Look in James 1, 22. James 1, 22 through 25. I'm going to read this in the ERV version. It says, do what God's teaching says. Don't just listen and do nothing. People are doing that week after week. Going to that building. Getting a little nap. And going home, got other things to do, right? It says, when you only sit and listen, you're fooling yourselves. 23 says, hearing God's teaching and doing nothing is like looking at your face in the mirror and doing nothing about what you saw. You know, think about that, ladies. You look in the mirror and you got a big old string of lipstick all smeared down your face and you go, oh. And you just walk away. That's what God's saying you're doing about sin. You hear the preaching of the word and you make no corrections, no adjustments, no obedience to. It's usually, well, he preached a little too long today. Boy, he got a little mean. I don't know if I like I was thinking about going to another, you know, location because it says you go away and immediately forget how bad you looked. You better think about that. Remember, said God knows your thoughts. He knows your heart. He knows what's going on inside of you. You think, well, I ain't that bad to a sinless, holy one. The slightest of sin is unholy. And holy 
does not exist with unholy. Verse 25 says, But when you look into God's perfect law that sets people free, pay attention to it. When I'm sitting here telling you what God is saying, folks, listen. Wake up. Take notes. Make adjustments. Your own salvation, your eternity with Christ depends on it. If you there's that letter, that word again, if. If you do what it says, you will have God's blessings. Never just listen to his teachings and forget what you heard. Never. Don't do that. Romans 13. Look at Romans 13, 11 through 14. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Like I said, and if you can't keep up, write it down and go home and look it up. I'm going to read this one out of the Living Bible. Because Brittany needs to understand this. Don't you, Brittany? You know, all throughout God's Word, He's given you reasons why you ought to pay attention. And I like how this one starts off in the Living Bible. Romans 13, 11 starts off with another reason for right living. It's like, as if we hadn't told you enough already, here's another reason why you ought to do what God says. So there's another reason for right living. What's that mean? It means living right, living righteous, living right before God, doing what God asks, not what you think, what you feel, what you want, what he says. You know how late it is. Time is running out. Folks, all morning, I can't tell you how many scriptures, how many sermons kept going through my head, and I just felt like the Lord was rushing, rushing, rushing me, and I'm like, time's getting short. Time is getting short. God is doing a quick work here. Things are wrapping up. Am I going to be stupid and try to give you a date and time? No, because God said nobody knows. And I'm not going to sit here and be a false prophet for you. Other people can do that junk. Other people can sit here and try to make friends and talk all nice to you. I'm going to tell you what God says. I'm going to point you to his word and ask you to find out what he says and you do what he tells you to according to his word. And right here, he said, because the time is running out. It says, wake up, for the coming of the Lord is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day of his return will soon be here. So quit the evil deeds of darkness and put on the armor of right living. You going to tell me you're a Christian? Good Lord is saying, stop acting like the world. Stop. <coughs> Time is short. You better get right. You might not be going with him. As we, it's just to put on the armor of right living, as we who live in the daylight should. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, he says you need to be walking in the daylight. That means doing what's right. Not walking in darkness. Not walking in sin. Be decent and true. Don't be a liar. Decent and true in everything you do so that all can approve your behavior. Don't spend your time in wild parties getting drunk in adultery and lust or fighting or jealousy. All this worldly junk, all the drama, the drama for your mama, right? Verse 14 says, But ask the Lord Jesus Christ to help you live as you should. And don't make plans to enjoy evil. It goes back to where we started. 
we all, based on our own lustful thoughts and desires, Satan will come bring that little thought, that thing that you like. Hey, look at her. Oh, here's a chance for a, a something for nothing. You know, let's go gambling. Or let, ooh, there's some drugs over here. Wow, you want to get, get a drink? Whatever it is that draws you. All right here he says, don't be making plans to go get involved in that. You make the plans to stay out, to get in him, not in sin. We circled all the way back. Look at 1 John 4.17. 1 John 4.17. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth, as it is in heaven. We got to get a clue, folks. We've got to change this thing from this to him and his kingdom. Change me, O oh Lord. Have your way in me. Matthew 10, 38 and 39 says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Good Lord is saying, listen, if it's all about you and you're trying to live your life, do what you want in it, you lose. But Christ says, you lay that down and take me up, you win. This is the message of the gospel of the kingdom, folks. Living like Christ, here and now, in earth as it is in heaven. What is Christ's word on the matter? Repent. Change. Wash your garments. Jesus Christ is coming back for a bride without spot or wrinkle. He wrote it in the book for a reason. So we would know. What is God's desire? Is your desire to fulfill His? To please Him? Or is it all about you? Remember this all started with Matthew 24, 14. That's the whole crux of this message. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Christ is coming back, and he's asking us, he's asking folks like me to come out here and tell you, get right. Be righteous. Be real. Being a phony, don't cut it. God is not fooled. Get in the book. Get in His Word. His kingdom. His ways. And I'm going to leave you with some homework. Because as far as I know, that's the last part, part nine in the series of the Gospel of the Kingdom. But your homework... Remember the other lesson, couple lessons back, I told you all to go back and read Psalm 51. If you hadn't done that yet, go back and read Psalm 51. I want you to understand the right heart attitude. And then I want you to review these notes. Like I said, you can go out online, pull these down, or at least if you were sitting here and you play these tapes, write those verses down. I want you to go back and underline them, highlight them in your Bible. I want you to be able to see it for yourself. Don't believe something because you heard me say it. I want you to see it for yourself. And then the last part of your homework, go and preach the gospel of the kingdom. 
That's an order from the Lord. Don't sit. Go and show. Go and tell. Spread the word. God loves you. The Father says that this day and every day is His day. And He loves you. And He's wanting you to love Him in return. Surrender your will to His. Repent. Ask God to save you. To save you from you. To deliver you from sin. And to make you like Him. And I, I, I look forward to seeing you in heaven. All right? Love you guys. Y'all have a blessed day.